So we've been hearing about the future and how things are going to be in 10 or 20 or 50 years. I want you to think about a more distant future for humanity, maybe 100 years, 400 years in the future, maybe 1,000 years, 10,000 years, or even beyond, and in particular in terms of the energy we use and what we use it for. One of the first people to think about the long-term future of humanity was this guy, Robert Malthus. Malthus pointed out that as long as humans are well-fed and content and happy, they'll just keep reproducing and the population of the planet will increase exponentially. And at some point, the planet just won't be able to sustain that many people. We'll run out of food, we'll run out of fresh water, we'll run out of something. And at that point, we would have what today we call a Malthusian catastrophe. You'll have riots and chaos and everything will be terrible and that's how the human population will be kept in check. It's a pretty pessimistic view, but it's kind of hard to refute. The Earth just can't support us for very long. The problem is, it turns out Malthus so far was wrong, and that's just not how things have gone. And the reason is that people are smart, and we're a lot more like this whale than we are like the barnacles on the whale's nose. What I mean by that is that the barnacles, they're stupid. They don't have any intelligence, they don't have any volition, they just have to accept whatever food happens to drift by, and that's what they eat. That controls their growth, that controls their overall population. And so in that sense, you would expect something like a Malthusian catastrophe for barnacles. But the whale is different. If the whale gets hungry and it needs more food, it can go out and hunt for some more food. It can use energy that it got from its food to gather more resources until it hits some other limit. So humanity is smart and that's what we do. We take energy and we use it to get more resources to continue to grow our population and avoid a Malthusian catastrophe. And that's what we have successfully done since Malthus's time, defying his predictions. We do this because we grow food. Now, plants on Earth collect sunlight. They use the sunlight, that energy, to turn carbon dioxide into more plant and energy for us to use. But they're limited on Earth. Plants are limited by the distribution of nutrients on the surface and the distribution of fresh water on the surface. So being clever, we've been able to redistribute the nutrients on the surface of the Earth and the water on the surface of the Earth to grow more food and sustain the human population growth for centuries. And we call this agriculture and fertilization, uh, irrigation and fertilization. So we take energy and we use it to make more foods, food for ourselves to keep pace with our population growth. And there's really no limit to how long we can keep doing this. And that's because energy is abundant and we can always keep using energy to make more food. If we ran out of fresh water, in principle, we could use seawater. We could desalinate the seawater. It just takes energy. We've got as much as we want for fresh water. If we run out of nutrients, we can get more phosphorus out of rocks. We can get more nitrogen out of the atmosphere. We can keep fertilizing the ground and create more and more food. And so that is why, as we've continued to grow as a species and multiply our numbers, we've continued to increase our energy use, and we've continued to use more and more energy to sustain ourselves and avoid the Malthusian catastrophe. This chart shows the energy use of the United States uh, since 1650. The blue dots are estimates or measurements of how much energy the U.S. uses, and the y-axis here is logarithmic, so that means that a straight line on this plot represents exponential growth at some rate. The red line is exponential growth rate at about 3% per year, which is about the population growth of the United States over that time. And what you can see is that energy tracks the population, this 3% annual growth, pretty well. And it's not just the United States, of course. The entire planet has population growing exponentially, and as a result, the whole planet uses more and more energy exponentially to keep up with that and avoid the Malthusian catastrophe. But, you say, we can't keep this up. Because look at where this energy is coming from. It's coming from natural gas, it's coming from oil, and it's coming from coal. Those are all fossil fuels. Fossil fuels contribute greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, and they're changing the environment. And indeed, that's how things came along, was because we needed more energy to keep up with population growth and the other things that we do. Sometime around the 1880s, we had to switch away from biofuels like wood and get into coal. And sometime in the 1950s, we switched over to majority petroleum and natural gas. Petroleum, natural gas, and coal. They're all heating the planet through greenhouse warming. 
So we definitely have to stop doing that. But that doesn't mean that we have to stop growing. That doesn't mean we're going to hit a Malthusian catastrophe as a result of getting off of fossil fuels. For instance, we could switch to solar energy. Solar energy doesn't produce any greenhouse warming. We have all of this abundant sunlight. Solar energy will save us from Malthus's prediction. Well, not quite. The reason is that exponential growth is really fast, and there's only so much sunlight. If you look, say, 250 years out at where our energy use as a planet will be at 3% growth, then in about 250 years, one-fifth of the land area of the planet would have to be covered in solar panels to provide enough energy to maintain our growth. And it just keeps getting worse from there. After 350 years, the entire land surface of the Earth would have to be covered. After 400 years from now, the entire surface of the entire Earth would have to be covered in solar panels, and then we'll hit our Malthusian catastrophe. So this, this is a short-term solution. It will definitely get us past where global warming is going to be a problem. But it will not avoid the catastrophe Malthus predicted that would come on the span of two or three or 400 years. So solar is not a long-term solution if we're going to keep growing. But science, science can save us. We have other ways to make energy. We have nuclear fission. Fission, nuclear power, doesn't produce greenhouse gases. And it can produce basically as much energy as we want, and that can continue to grow our population. Of course, fission power has problems. There's nuclear waste. There's always the danger of meltdown. There's a lot of problems with fission power. But science can come to the rescue again, because we have fusion power, another form of nuclear power that's just around the corner, the physicists promise us. And this will produce abundant energy without as much nuclear waste, without any risk of nuclear meltdown. And we have a potentially unlimited supply of fusion power that we can use to power us. In addition, you don't have to put solar panels on the ground. Solar panels could work if you just moved them out of the way so you could do things here on Earth and they collected the sunlight somewhere else. And countries like Japan are seriously looking into building power plants in space, solar panels in space that collect sunlight, beam it down to Earth as lasers or microwaves, that energy is then collected on the surface of the Earth, turned into electrical power to power all of the things we do. So with fusion power and solar power in space, we can avoid all of the limits that would otherwise prevent us from generating the power we need to continue growing as a species. Except it's not going to work. We're still going to melt. And to see why, look even further into the future. Not just 400 years, maybe not just 1,000 years into the future, but think about what exponential growth can do if you give it 1,500 years or 2,500 years. At 3% growth rate, you double the energy use every 30 years or so. And in about 1,400 years, the total energy consumption of humanity on the Earth will equal the output of the sun. I don't mean the amount of sunlight that strikes the Earth. We're going to hit that in 400 years. I mean the total output of the entire star in all directions. And it gets worse from there. In 2,500 years, we will be using as much energy as all of the stars in the galaxy, all 200 billion of them put together. So this is not a sustainable future. So Malthus was probably right. We've got to hit this at some point. And the reason why is a little subtle. Why can't we just generate that much energy here on Earth? Why can't our fusion plants just make the energy we need to grow the food we need to keep expanding our population? And the reason is energy itself is going to become the limiting factor, not being able to generate it, but being able to get rid of it. When I look out at you here in the audience, you are listening to me talk and thinking about the future like I've asked you to because you had breakfast this morning. Your breakfast had calories, that's energy that you got from your food, and you are using that energy to run your neurons and do the things that you do as a human. But when you use that energy, you don't use it up. It doesn't disappear, because you can't destroy energy. You have to get rid of it when you're done with it, and then get more energy to do more thinking. And the way you get rid of it is you are warm, and you give the energy off as mid-infrared radiation. So if I had mid-infrared goggles, and I put them on, and I looked at you out in the audience, I could tell which of you were living, metabolizing, thinking people, and which of you were crash test dummies or mannequins, because you are warm and you glow in the mid-infrared. That's the energy you are giving off. And it's not just you as a person, it's also everything that you do, the computers you use, the heating that you turn on in your homes. We know people are home in these houses 
because we can see the heat in mid-infrared, the waste heat from their computers, their televisions, their blenders, everything that they're doing inside leaks out of the house, as it must, or else the house inside would warm up and warm up, and everything inside of it would eventually melt. This is a form of heating the planet. When we generate energy, whether it's at the coal plant or in the fusion reactor, that energy eventually finds its way into this waste heat and heats the surface of the planet. This is direct global warming. Right now, it's not a very big problem. Compared to the insulation that's provided by greenhouse gases, it's really only about 1% of the issue. So in 30 years, it's going to be 2%. And in another 30 years, it's going to be 4% and then 8% and so on until it completely dwarfs the greenhouse warming that we're seeing today. So over the course of one or 200 years, we definitely have to get this greenhouse warming component down by switching away from fossil fuels. But on a time scale of 400 years, we simply have to stop producing so much energy here on the planet's surface, or we'll heat it directly, and there's no way around this. This is fundamental thermodynamics. So this idea that maybe we could collect the energy out in space and beam it back down to Earth is great for getting rid of global warming, but what you're really doing is taking sunlight that normally would have missed the Earth and not heated it, and you're redirecting it back onto the Earth. And if you kept building more and more of these solar collectors and beaming the energy to Earth, you would just be focusing all this extra sunlight on the Earth and heating its surface. So if we did anything, fusion power or solar panels in space, and kept a 3% growth rate, then in 1,500 years, we would require as much energy as the whole sun puts out. And that's how much energy this Earth would have to be putting out. And there's no way that can happen. The surface of the Earth would be uninhabitable in a matter of centuries at that pace. So the solution is that we can't keep the energy here. If we're going to keep expanding as a species, if we're going to continue to do more and more computation and use more and more energy into the future at the rate that we have historically for centuries, then we're going to have to do a lot of those computations and a lot of that work and a lot of that living somewhere else so that we can get rid of the heat. So all those data servers that compute our lives, that we use to do everything that we do in terms of computation, which are only going to get more intense in the future, we have to move those off the surface of the Earth so that they don't heat us up and make the planet uninhabitable. And once that starts, once we've become accustomed to collecting solar energy in space and using it up there, well, then there's no limit from there. We can continue to launch more and more of these things, more and more people will do their work up in space, and we can continue to climb that exponential curve and continue to expand as a species. One of the first people to think of this was a physicist named Freeman Dyson, who thought that perhaps extraterrestrial civilizations would already be ahead of us on this point, and they would have surrounded their entire star with collectors. This idea is sometimes called a Dyson sphere, a swarm of collectors that collect solar energy or stellar energy, do the work with it, and then radiate it away again. And so you should be able to tell if a star is surrounded by such things for the same reason that you can tell that someone is home in this picture, because that star would have its light being re-radiated at mid-infrared wavelengths. Now, eventually, we're going to be using up all the starlight that there is to use, all the sunlight, and we'll have to go to the next star. And so maybe that takes 100,000 years before we get to that next star. But once someone arrives there, then they can start climbing that exponential curve again, collecting more and more energy, generating more and more waste heat, and then they can go to the next star, and then to the next star, and so on. And that process of getting, getting to all of the stars in the whole galaxy, that might take 100 million years. But that's a lot shorter than the age of the universe. And so alien civilization, looking at the Milky Way galaxy, going forward hundreds of millions of years, might first see the sun down in there somewhere, get a little extra warm in mid-infrared radiation as we build our Dyson sphere, and then the next star over gets a little warm, and so on. And each of the stars, as we spread throughout the galaxy, will give off more and more infrared radiation until the entire galaxy is giving off a lot of mid-infrared radiation from the work that we do if you were to look at it with your mid-infrared goggles. So this is what I do. We're looking at other galaxies to see if this has already happened. We use a NASA satellite called WISE. It looks at the sky at mid-infrared wavelengths, and it looked at the entire sky. 
And we want to know if any of the galaxies out there have already been completely inhabited by other species trying to avoid their Malthusian catastrophe and climbing their exponential curve and using up the energy that they have available to them in their galaxy. So we look at the sky and we see pictures like this. We see lots of blue dots. Those are stars in our galaxy that do not have Dyson spheres around them. Each of those is not inhabited by a civilization that is using up all of its starlight. But that smudge in the middle looks an awful lot like a galaxy, a distant galaxy that has already had that happen to it. And so that's what we're looking for in the data. Now, we haven't found that yet. This particular artifact I'm showing you is, is just a, a camera glitch, basically. This, the satellite was looking at a very bright star, and it's still seeing that star as an after image. Um, and so this isn't it, but it is what we're looking for. And it demonstrates that if alien civilizations have done this in other galaxies, we should be able to detect them today. So when you're thinking about the future and all the talks that you see here today, it's important to think about what the planet will be like when you're older and when your children are older. It's important to think about how we're going to deal with the energy challenges, not just in 50 years or 100 years, but also in 400 years when we start to approach that Malthusian catastrophe. So I want you to think about that, but keep going. Continue the experiment. What is it going to be like when we are using so much energy that we need every drop of sunlight that strikes the surface of the Earth? What is humanity going to be like when we've moved a lot of our work and maybe our lives out off into space and we start to use up all of the energy that the sun has to offer? What will humanity be like when we've got another civilization around another star nearby and we do the same thing there? What sort of super Malthusian catastrophe will we be avoiding when 100 million years from now we've spanned the galaxy and we're using all of the energy that we have available to us in, uh, in the entire galaxy itself? But also today, in your own lives, what will it mean to you and about our future as a species if you read in the paper at some point that astronomers have made a discovery and that they can point up to a galaxy up into the sky and say, there's an alien civilization that lives in that galaxy and when it comes to energy use and its limits, we've already seen it and it's already happened and there it is. Thank you.